Hey Amen. Well, uh, good morning once again. Uh, I know that God has planned for us an incredible uh, service. It's already been amazing so far. And, and I'm just excited to share with you what God has really placed on my heart today. Uh, you know, but, but yesterday was incredible. Yeah. We got an opportunity, as uh, Georgina shared, to be out together on campus, uh, have a little time tailgating for homecoming. Uh, eat together, but also to go out together and uh, fundraise for our special missions. And so, you know, we're doing this uh, event called Operation Doughboy. I mentioned earlier, what the heck is that, you know? Uh, But it's a time where we can go out. We basically get uh, uh, Krispy Kreme donuts. Uh, They give us a deal if we buy a certain amount of them. And we have donuts for days. Uh, but then we're able to go out and, and ask for donations as we give away Krispy Kreme donuts. And who doesn't like Krispy Kreme donuts? Amen. Uh, so, you know, uh, we got an opportunity. We went out on campus. Uh, we we, we uh, all got together uh, to tailgate and then sent out teams here and there. And it was incredible. Uh, just seeing everybody give their whole hearts to God and to the mission to evangelize the world. Uh, And this morning, that's the title of the lesson today. Wholehearted devotion. This is certainly the type of devotion that God wants us to have. Wholehearted devotion. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And this is where we're going to be focusing our attention today. Uh, 2 Corinthians, it's a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Uh, You know, Paul, uh, one of the greatest Christians to ever live, wrote the majority of the New Testament. uh, And he's discipling, he's challenging these different churches on their sin uh, to remain faithful to the Lord and to continue to do uh, all that the Lord has commanded. But we pick up here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, in verse 2. And Paul says, make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have exploited no one. I do not say this to condemn you. I have said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. I have spoken to you with great frankness. I take great pride in you. I'm greatly encouraged In all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. For when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest. But we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside and fears within. But God who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me so that my joy was greater than ever. Point number one this morning is wholehearted love for one another. See, Paul talks about having a love for each other as followers of Jesus Christ. It's a wholehearted love that's forged on a relationship with God, forged on the unity we have in the Holy Spirit's, and forged through the spiritual battle that we face together every day. You know, uh, growing up, before I became a disciple, my friendships, they were all based on uh, people who had the same interests as me. Right. right? And so, you know, I was naturally friends with the people on my high school football team. Why? Because they liked to play football, and so did I. Uh, I was naturally really close to the guys on my high school wrestling team because we both liked wrestling. I was naturally connected with people who love the outdoors, who love adventures, who love mountains or rivers. Why? Because that's on my heart. I love camping. I love backpacking and canoeing and kayaking. And so anybody who had these same interests, they automatically, uh, very quickly and easily became my friends. Why? You like the same stuff as I do. Let's be best friends. Let's do everything together. It's going to be incredible. And, and this is what we base Friendships on outside of God's kingdom. People who like the same stuff. You know, but when I became a disciple, things uh, took a little turn for me. Uh, Although I do like people who like the same stuff as I do. Uh, They're a lot of fun in my eyes. Uh, But 
my convictions and my relationships changed to becoming best friends with people who uh, were in the spiritual battle together. People who we go through some stuff together. People who give their whole hearts to me because, number one, they love God first and foremost. So many of you know, uh, one of my best friends is Mike Patterson. A a lot of us here know him. He led the church uh, a few years ago here in Gainesville uh, and has moved on to even greater things. Uh, God continues to move him around and and, and preach the gospel. Uh, But this man became one of my best friends in life. Uh, He's not like me at all. Uh, He's very different. He, he, He doesn't, he's not super athletic. I mean, I'm not either, but I, I you know, I, I like to pretend, uh, you know, but he can really care less about sports, uh, you know, football, Gator football, you know, uh, that's, that's for you. You can have that. I'm more into the pro, pro wrestling, you know, uh, he doesn't care to go out there and play ultimate Frisbee or basketball. At least these are things that are on my heart and my passion. Uh, you know, Mike Patterson, he's super into aliens and, and conspiracy theories. Did you hear about this? And I'm like, bro, I don't even care about that stuff. <laughs> but we forged this incredible friendship that's based on the spiritual battle. That's based on me going through stuff in life, him going through hard times in life and being there for each other. And we're best friends and we're bonded because of the spirit we share in Jesus Christ. Amen. I think about my friend Steve Milton over there. Amen. Now here's a man who is 20 years older than me. Uh, you know, we have uh, a lot of things that we do like together, but we have things that we don't like. You know, they're, they're completely different. But very quickly, since a million I've gotten here, we've become great friends with Steve and Angie Middleton. Uh, We very much appreciate them and uh, just their hearts, their experience, and their wisdom that God has given them through their years together in His kingdom. And, you know, Steve and I uh, enjoy our prayer times together on on Wednesday mornings. Uh, I enjoy the studies we're able to be a part of and just some of the conversations we have, right? A lot of that was forged, though, through bumping heads initially. Although we had their full support from the beginning, uh, I do have a past in Gainesville when I left God, and so we had to work through a lot of that to uh, help Angie and Steve to see that uh, I'm a different man than I used to be. Amen. And so, guys, I appreciate your support. Steve, Angie, we appreciate your friendship and, and uh, how you've so freely given your hearts to, to us. You guys are incredible. Oh, but see, in God's kingdom... Friendships are built on the spiritual battle and the unity of the Spirit. See, it's, it's incredible. Talk, Paul's talking about here that, you know, we need to open wide our hearts to each other. Now, see, that's not always the easiest thing to do. Because we, have, we go through life and people hurt us, do they not? Yes. Somebody might take advantage of us freely offering our hearts to them. And so it leaves scars. It leaves pain. And it leaves this wall that we try to keep people out of our hearts. But Paul says, no, 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 open wide your hearts. Make room in your hearts for us. So we have to make a decision as disciples to be willing to open our hearts to the people around us in God's kingdom and the people we study the Bible with. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we'll look at another scripture that Paul is teaching another church on how to really offer your heart to other people. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Bible says here in verse 6, We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. See, Paul says, you know, you have to let people into your heart. Uh, You know, we get excited, do we not, when we meet someone who wants to learn about God. 
as a disciples, that is our call to go and make disciples, to teach people the gospel. And when somebody comes and you do a seeking God study with them and they say, I want to seek God with all my hearts. We get fired up. Cool. There's a bunch of studies. Let's just do them right now. Uh, when, are you, when are you free? You want to meet tomorrow? Uh, you want to meet the day after that? Let's do this. All right? And we get pumped up because this is our purpose in life, yeah. to make disciples. But we forget that we're supposed to not only share the gospel with them, but our, our lives as well. Amen. And so we got to make sure that we're opening up our hearts and our lives to bring people in so they can see the kingdom of God in our lives and our relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. You know, I want to really lift up my wife, Amelia, for this. I believe that uh, she's probably one of the greatest examples of th this scripture. Because when she meets a woman and studies the Bible with them, she really welcomes them into her life, right. into her home, and becomes their best friend. I'm so proud of her relationship with Jessica back there, who got baptized a couple weeks ago. Um, because that's what she did, right? She met her on campus. They got together for lunch. Uh, it wasn't just, hey, let's crank you through these Bible studies and teach you what it means to be a disciple. Come follow me, just like Jesus called his disciples to follow him, and learn about the qualities of Jesus that are in my life. And so I believe that they have become quickly very good friends. But that is the call from the scriptures to open up our lives to other people. I think about uh, the guys that study the Bible with me. Uh, both, it was Blake, Dave, and Mike Riley. And these guys were incredible, right? Uh, you know, you had the hammer, which we, uh, sometimes we need the hammer, do we not? Yeah. Rakeem says, yeah, I needed the hammer. <laughs> but, you know, you got uh, the guy or the girl that just lays out the truth no matter what. Hey, this is what the Bible says, take it or leave it. And it's so easy to walk away from that person because it hurts, right? You, got, you just got hammered to the heart. And so we need other people in our lives that wrap their arms around us, that, uh, you know, are there to be compassionate, to be persistent in our lives so that we don't walk away when we're confronted with the truth. And so I had these three different characters in my Bible studies. I had Blake, who was just like the name would suggest, Blake. You know, he was just, uh, you know, just, just pounding me, right? You're not saved, you don't know the truth, you're going to hell, brah. You know, and I was like, man, you're nuts, dude. I don't want any part of this. Like, you don't understand, I have had these convictions for my whole 19-year-old life. And, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty solid on them. And he's like, cool. So, you know, take this book right here and show me why you believe that. And I'm like, well, yeah, okay. Uh, but I'm going to do it later. Like, you know, I'm not, I can't do it right now, right? And so anyways, I, I walked away. I, I want no part of uh, this group of people anymore. Uh, but because of the other two guys and how they really extended their hearts and their lives to me, it offered me a uh, 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 comfort to come back and really feel like I was listened to, to feel that uh, like uh, somebody was unwilling to give up on me. And so I had Mike Riley who literally called me every day and was unwilling to take no for an answer. Uh, finally, when he got me on the phone, uh, he was like persistent. Hey, let's study the Bible. Let's continue to help you grow in your convictions from the Word of God. And so I said, you know, I don't know if I want that. Uh, I'm, I'm tired. Uh, and he, he just wouldn't take no for an answer. He's like, I'll come over and I'll bring dinner. Let's do this. And I'm like, okay. So he brings uh, Dave Heron along with him, who was just you know, super compassionate and loving. And he came over, and, and, and they both just listened to me. They listened to everything I had. This is why I'm saved. This is why I'm saved. And from the scriptures, very lovingly and patiently explained why, uh, you know, I didn't understand things in context. So it's very important. We've got to make sure that we're not only uh, teaching the word of God, the gospel, but that we open up our lives to people and bring them in. We have to extend our heart to other people. You see, a friend can reach someone's heart so much easier than a teacher can. All right, we can teach people all we want, but unless you're their friend, unless they feel like you've extended your heart to them, when uh, you challenge them, they're just going to run and they're not going to think that you want to, that you really care for them. Let's look at one of the scripture in John chapter 13. This is a pretty familiar one for a lot of us, but Jesus gives us a new command, he says. John 13 and verse 34 
He says, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. You know, at first glance, this is super easy. Yes, you know, that's exactly what I want. I just want to love everybody. I don't want to hate people. I just want to love the whole world. And so it's, 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 it's got a, a sense of ease to it. It's a quick decision, right? But it really changes when you look at the Scripture in a deeper, uh, a deeper level and put it into perspective. You know, so if I was to tell, hey, Brandon, you know, I need you to, uh, to really love Emmanuel. Cool. Yeah, I love the guy. You know, we're besties. Uh, he's awesome. We like to hang out. Cool. No, no, no. Brandon, I need you to love Emmanuel like Jesus loves Emmanuel. Now, see, that changes things quite a bit. Because we can love by our own definition of love, but if we choose to love like Jesus loves, then it means a sacrificial love. It means a love that puts other people's needs and desires before our own. So Jesus says, My command is not for you to love people, but that you love them as I love them. Amen. So it gives us perspective. And he says, you know what, by this, everybody's going to know that you're my disciples. Everyone will know that you're my followers if you love people like I love them. You know, I think that this is incredible. Uh, and it's the way that God tells us to love each other. You know, there is a uh, um, modern day parable that I want to read to you. I think some of you may have heard before. Uh, Peter, Markari, and I were talking about it. Uh, but it just blows me away. And it really talks about uh, how, we're, how we give our hearts to other people. Uh, it's called The Perfect Heart. Uh, it says, One day a young man was standing in the middle of a town proclaiming that he had the most beautiful heart in the whole valley. A large crowd gathered and they admired his heart for it was perfect. There was not a mark or a flaw in it. Yes, they all agreed it truly was the most beautiful heart they had ever seen. The young man was very proud and boasted more loudly about his beautiful heart. Suddenly an old man appeared at the front of the crowd and said, Why, your heart is not nearly as beautiful as mine. The crowd and the young man looked at the old man's heart. It was beating strongly, yet it was full of scars. It had places where pieces were removed and other pieces were put in, but they didn't quite fit right. They were, there were several jagged edges. In fact, in some places there were deep holes where entire pieces were just missing. The people stared. How could he say that his heart was more beautiful, they thought. The young man looked at the old man's heart, saw its state, and laughed. You must be joking, he said. How can you compare your heart to mine? Mine is perfect, where yours is a mess of scars and tears. Yes, said the old man. Yours is perfect looking, but I would never trade your heart for mine. You see, every scar represents a person to whom I have given my heart. I tear out a piece of my heart and give it to them. And oftentimes they give me a piece of their heart which fits back into the empty place in my heart. But because the pieces aren't exact... They have some rough edges, which I cherish because they remind me of the love we share. Sometimes I've given pieces of my heart away, and the other person hasn't returned a piece of their heart to me. Or perhaps they gave me a piece and it was ripped away. These are the empty gouges you see. see you see, giving your heart means taking a chance. Although these gouges are painful, they stay open. They remind me of the love that I have for these people too. And I hope someday they may return and fill the space I have waiting for them in my heart. So now do you see what a beautiful heart truly is? The young man stood silently with 
tears running down his cheeks. He walked up to the old man, reached into his perfect, young, and flawless heart, and ripped the piece out. He offered it to the old man with trembling hands, for this was the first time he had ever really offered his heart. The old man took his offering. He placed it in his heart and then took a piece from his old scarred heart and placed it in the wound of the young man's heart. You see, it fits, but not perfectly, as there were some jagged edges. The young man looked at his heart, no longer perfect, but more beautiful than ever, since love from the old man's heart flowed into his How sad it is to go through life with a whole, untouched heart. You see, I share that because that was a a, a parable that really blew me away when I first heard it. Uh, It's so true how, uh, you know, if we go through life without really extending our hearts to other people, uh, we may be safe. We may have this perfectly untouched heart that we feel good about, but... It never compares to a heart that is extended to others and has been made whole by allowing people to give their hearts back to us. Turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And we'll get our second point today started in verse 8. The Bible says, even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurts you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance. That leads to salvation and leaves no regrets. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness. What eagerness to clear yourself. What indignation. What alarm. What longing. What concern. What readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So, even though I wrote you, it was neither on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the injured party, but rather that before God you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all this, we are encouraged. In addition to our own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was, because his spirit has been refreshed by all of you. I have boasted to him about you, and you have not embarrassed me. But just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting about you to Titus has proved to be true as well. And his affection for you is all the greater when he remembers that we were all obedient, receiving him, that you were all obedient, receiving, receiving him with fear and trembling. I am glad that I can have complete confidence. In you. Point number two is wholehearted discipling. See, what is discipling? Discipling is challenging someone on their sin or t- uh, to be more like Jesus. To challenge somebody, you know what, this is Jesus' life and this is your life, and let's help them come together so they can be more like Jesus Christ. See, Paul describes how, you know, he wrote this letter to the church in Corinth. And he said, you know, you guys are in sin. You need to repent and return to your first love and be more like Jesus Christ. And so, you know, he's describing that, man, at the end of this, I wasn't even sure how you were going to take it. I might have overdone it. I might have said a little bit too much. I might have uh, pushed a little bit too hard. What is your response going to be? He goes as far to say that initially he regretted writing this letter. He said, but I was so surprised and so encouraged by your response. Because I see that the letter hurt you, but that it allowed you to change. See, he talks here about two different types of sorrow that we can have. 
uh, when we realize our sin, when we realize the gravity of our actions and how it affects other people, we can become sorry, we can uh, feel guilty about things, we can become heavy in our hearts, but we have two choices. The Bible says we can have a godly sorrow or we can have a worldly sorrow. See, worldly sorrow, you might feel bad about what you did, but it doesn't bring you to change your life at all. It doesn't lead you to repentance. It doesn't lead you to do anything different the next time around. It says worldly sorrow brings death, spiritual death. But he says, see, you have had godly sorrow. He said godly sorrow brings repentance. It brings refreshments. And so, you know, I've studied the Bible with people who, who've just read the Bible, studied the Bible, and been so convicted about their lives. You know, they cry through some of the Bible studies. They're broken about the gravity of their sin and how, uh, because of their sin, Jesus came and went to the cross. But it, it doesn't leave them to change. Oftentimes, they walk away. They, they refuse to really change the things in their life that are more important to them to seek God and His kingdom first. They oftentimes, you know, uh, just neglect doing what it really takes to have a great relationship with God, which is reading your Bible and praying on a daily basis. And so because of that, they they feel bad, right? They have a a worldly sorrow because it doesn't inspire change in their lives. So I'm so grateful when, you know, we get to study the Bible with people who have a godly sorrow. Uh, I'm so excited for uh, Rakeem, who is going to be baptized today. You know, I, I didn't know Rakeem when he first started coming around earlier this year, you know, but I did meet him a couple months ago. Uh, and, and, bro, you're such a different person, a different man than I first met. Uh, I'm very proud of you of some of the things that you shared from before, uh, some of the things that the other brothers have shared from when you uh, first started coming around and first studied the Bible. Uh, it's just completely different than what I see in your life. Uh, you know, here's a man who... Uh, decided to finally submit and surrender to God. Yeah. Uh, finally decided that he's willing to uh, hear God's call from his word and, may, and, and truly repent in his life. To set aside his sinful nature. To set aside his even desires for certain things he has in his life. To put God and his will as number one. Okay. So I'm proud as, uh, you know, as the brothers uh, get to baptize you today. Uh, to see you go from, your, uh, from darkness into God's wonderful light and be part of His kingdom. I'm proud of your repentance, uh, Rakeem. You know, but it's incredible to see how God allows us when we have that godly sorrow, when we decide to repent in our life, how He lifts us up and gives us the desires of our hearts. Turn over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 with me. And we get some insight into this wholehearted discipling. You see, wholehearted discipling only works with somebody who has a godly sorrow, who desires repentance. But we've got to make sure that as we disciple people, we're using the Scriptures. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. The Bible says, All Scripture is God-breathed, meaning it's from God, and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, when we disciple people, when we challenge them, we got to make sure that we're using the Bible because we want to make them like Jesus Christ and not like ourselves, right? Right. So it's got to be from God's Word, not from our opinions. Even if they're godly opinions, we got to make sure that we uh, show people God's Word, which... Uh, promotes them to change, right? Inspires them to change. Uh, See, this is how we help each other be more like Jesus Christ. This is how we help each other make it to heaven. And the Bible says this is how we equip each other for every good work. Uh, You know, I know different times in my life that, uh, you know, the Bible talks about rebuking here. It's a stern correction. It's where somebody hops in your face and says, dude, you're in sin, you need to change. And, and you, know, you know, what's funny is I don't really remember the day in, day out, uh, discipleship times, training times with people. I don't really remember the, the, the things that were easy to overcome and change. 
What I remember is the spiritual hammer, right? Uh, There was somebody got in my face and said, dude, you need to change. If you continue to live like this, you're not going to make it. We remember these things because they were difficult, because they hurt a little bit, right? And because we were able to overcome uh, to repentance through them. See, I'm grateful for the times in my life where somebody's uh, jumped in there and really shaken me up. Because that's what I needed at the time to overcome my selfishness and my sinful nature. How do you react when somebody uh, comes to you with the scriptures and, and, and is a little bit forthright and challenging? Do you accept it with humility? Or do you immediately become proud and defensive? We've got to make sure that we're allowing people to use the scriptures to teach us, to train us, to correct us, right. and sometimes to rebuke us. Amen? Uh, turn over back over to 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 7. I'm sorry, chapter 8. We'll get into our third point. Second Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of, of a, severi- a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able. And even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they, extended, they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion the Completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it to the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the heart to do so. Now finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Point number three, the final point today is wholehearted sacrifice. Uh, You know, I know that, uh, you know, in years past, uh, you know, there's been times where I've really struggled with special missions, kind of what we're doing. Uh, We've explained earlier that, uh, you know, we have this collection that we do uh, to continue to support churches around the world, uh, churches in third world countries that can't support themselves. And so we, we take great strides to fundraising, to personal sacrifice in order to uh, really help these people uh, and continue to advance the gospel around the world. Uh, you know, but there's been times where I've just struggled with it, you know. I've known other people that, you know, why, why do we do this? This is just a, a modern ide- ideology, this is something that, you know, we just kind of created to uh, uh, raise funds and continue to, to push churches around the world, right? Well, we understand that, obviously, what we read in the Scriptures, this is not a new concept. This is something that they did in the Bible. Not only did they do that, they did it year after year. Yeah. Paul compares their hearts in verse uh, 10 to their hearts the year before for special missions. Hey, guys, remember how you were last year? How eager and fired up you were to give the special missions? You got the same opportunity. Let's have the same heart you had last year. It's incredible. Uh, there's a paper that's been on uh, everybody's chair. Uh, maybe it's on the floor now. Uh, but this is uh, basically our Crown of Thorns project. 
This is a, a project that we put into place within our group of churches uh, years ago. Uh, just the plan to evangelize the world. Uh, we believe that we need to call people back to the standard of the Bible. Uh, you know, there's so many different thoughts and theologies about Christianity today. So many different denominations, so many different uh, opportunities that you, uh, people have or different thoughts they have on how someone can be saved. We understand that the Bible has all the answers for that. And so we believe that we need to call people back to the standard. It's been 2,000 years since the first century when the church began. Uh, and we've got to get back to the standard for our lives, which is the Bible. Amen. Uh, but there's a scripture up towards the top. It's Acts 1, chapter 8. And Jesus says, You will be my witness. Oh, I'm sorry, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so we believe that the same call they had to evangelize the world and the, the Bible in the first century that we have the same call to evangelize the world in our generation. Jesus commands it in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, which was read earlier for contribution. But, you know, since our, our group of churches uh, began in, in Los Angeles, we consider that the modern-day Jerusalem, because that's where it started for us. Uh, and so Judea and Samaria is basically the United States and Canada. We've got to get there. And then, obviously, the ends of the earth today is still the ends of the earth. Uh, but as you see on, the, on this paper, everything in green is a place where we already have an established church. A church that believes in evangelizing the world, that has uh, uh, decided to have a life that is sold out to God's kingdom and His movements. And, and uh, uh, the purple ones are places where we have disciples, but there isn't an established church yet. This is a remnant group, is what we call them. Uh, a group that says, hey, we want to be part of it, uh, you know, uh, let's get this thing going, right? And then the red ones are uh, churches that are to be planted, and they usually have a date by when they're going to be planted. And as you see, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, the green ones, uh, you have the ends of the earth. Basically, uh, they chose, we chose the 12 biggest cities around the world, and we planted a church in them. Yeah. This is a biblical concept as you read through the book of Acts. So that when you establish a church in, in, a, in a, a metropolitan capital, then they can in turn grow that church and then send out churches around them. Yeah. Right? And so uh, even this year, uh, you can see that uh, Atlanta, Georgia was planted. Uh, you can see that New Haven, Connecticut was planted. Salt Lake City was planted this year. And then as we move out to uh, the international, we had Amsterdam uh, planted, Auckland, New Zealand uh, Davio and Phnom Penh, Philippines, Shenzhen, China, and Kathmandu, Nepal, which was just planted this summer. Uh, but we continue to plant new churches and support the ones that we've already sent out. Uh, our group of churches here on the eastern, uh, um, the eastern, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, eastern coast of the United States. Thank you. Uh, we, we directly oversee a lot of work in India. Uh, you know, India is incredible. I mean, there's uh, uh, 1.8 billion people there. Uh, and so we have uh, a church in, in New Delhi, in Chennai, in Bangalore. And, and we continue to see incredible things uh, that are done over there. We, we support, we, we send a lot of support to them. Uh, I think Georgina shared that uh, she's going next month to uh, their missions conference over there. Uh, I know my wife and I are going, a few other disciples, because... It's an opportunity to really connect with them, to see their faith, and to see the, uh, the, um, the fruit of when we give and sacrifice to help uh, all the people over there become disciples. But it's incredible because we put forth this plan because we believe that we've got to get to the end of the earth. We've got to evangelize the world in our generation. And obviously that takes our sacrifice. Uh, that's why we were out there in the, the heat of the day yesterday, uh, you know, giving our hearts, selling Krispy Kreme donuts, asking for donations, and sweating, yeah. singing songs, right? Walking around with this cooler of uh, drinks and, and, and donuts, saying, hey, you want to give? You want to give? Because we believe that if we give our hearts fully to God, that He's going to produce an incredible miracle, and we can continue to give and support these churches around the world. But it, it, special missions is what's going to get it done. Our sacrifice is what's going to get it done 
to continue to evangelize the world. See, without it, it's just we'll, we'll fall short, right? Uh, we can't leave uh, the people on the mission field abandoned to fend for themselves. Uh, it's incredible. You know, we have a goal by November 24th to raise $15,000 uh, as a congregation. And, and we're getting there. It's incredible. I know a lot of the Bible Talk leaders were going around this week uh, just getting your personal pledges on what you feel you can raise or what you're going to give. And so let's honor those. I want to encourage everybody, uh, if you have some of it or, or all of it, to go ahead and turn it in now. Uh, because even this week, we're going to send $3,000 uh, to meet the needs that are, are right now there. Uh, but we've got to make sure, I love in, in verse 12, Paul says, For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, right. not according to what one doesn't have. Mm-hmm. We know that God has all the money in the world, and our faith is what's required for Him to bless us. And so I believe that, you know, just I shared a lot of the stories with you about missions before, and just stepping out on faith and understanding that God can produce a miracle that God will allow us to fundraise, uh, will allow us to find uh, different ways to raise money for this event. So in closing today, let's make sure that we have a wholehearted devotion to God, a wholehearted love for one another, and that we open wide our hearts and our lives to each other, that we make room in our hearts for the people around us, and a wholehearted discipling relationships that we speak the truth in love as we help each other walk closer to God. And then we have a wholehearted sacrifice. And as we uh, give our hearts to special missions, we get to witness the incredible miracle that God will produce in the God of the glory.